whether you're under it or in it. Of all the things a project car is to you, the most important is a haven. Somewhere you can be mindful or mindless. A think factory, an isolation tank with a sunroof and maybe a V8. Pure meditation. It's a relaxing place to tease out problems, forge new concepts, and generally process the day-to-day -day speed bumps. Of late on solo spins, I've developed a hypothesis. And as the man said for the sake of a rhyme, it's a preposterous hypothesis. It involves karma. And you might say karma is preposterous in the first place, but trust me, everybody gets theirs. So here's what I'm thinking. Karma will haul you up for being stupid. You don't have to do wrong to invite the karmic retribution. Being silly, doing something that's less than clever, is to piss on karma's chips. And stick with me here, because this is where it gets all chicken and egg. Trying to restore a rusty old car is karma for trying to restore a rusty old car. Okay, I, I hear it now, outside the Think Factory, and realize it's probably more a coping mechanism just a funny little thought to help me live with the silly things I'm doing with an aging, ailing van and the seemingly never-ending karmic rust that has consumed my life as well as my vehicles. I could be living a simple life, solely focused on one little Anglo-Ital sport wedge, organised and linear, not a car in the world. Karma has been trying to tell me that, and I hear it, but clever just ain't me. You know, at the end of the road on my most recent spin of meditative motoring, there lay a field of Mercedes sprinters. As if to G me on with advocacy for the devil, these sprinters and their keeper are a counter to karma's message. Because the man who amassed these mercs is a champion to the cause. He says that my sprinter, the T1N model sprinter, is a superior machine, least in build quality, to the model that succeeded it, the NCV3. So perhaps what I'm doing, repairing a rusty old generation van rather than stumping up money for something newer with less work needed, isn't so stupid. And karma should back off. See, this is the van I have and every hour spent working on it is money I haven't spent on something else. Money that goes directly into the kitty to build myself a workshop, a dojo. And this is my MO my excuse for silliness. I'm building a sprinter-based camper, a practical one with simple things like a bed and a tow bar. And I'll hook a car transporter up to that tow bar, load the newly finished wedge on that transporter and point the mental health motorcade toward Greece, where the VW bay window bus lies peacefully waiting to be finished and sold to further fund the soup workshop.
you know, I decided initially, I thought it would be easier just to replace the channel section of the floor. And that's why I marked the blue line to cut most of the replacement section away. It would have been easier, but looking at the tracks of rust where water from the leaking windscreen was running across the floor, the best job was always going to be replacing as much of the floor as possible. This underfloor frame, it's only being held on now by the seam sealer Mercedes used at the factory. And if Mercedes have a superpower where build is concerned, then quality of their undersealing treatment seems to have always been at a high standard. I've spoken to quite a few W123 owners who said that their floors presented as being perfect from under the car, only for them to later find out that the underseal was holding the remains of the footwells together and even standing up to being unceremoniously poked with a screwdriver. So, rusting from the inside out is the true Mercedes secret weapon.
You know, when you pick up that thing that you need in prep for taking it to the place where you need it and arrive there only to find you've put it down again before you left. I was not going home for the paintbrushes. The toothbrush was a lucky thought buried in the bottom of my toolbox. I would have finger painted the epoxy primer onto the floor frame if I'd had to though. The flow wasn't stopping. Please give a warm welcome to the very beautiful, the very orange single passenger seat base, which is actually a driver's seat base that I imported from Germany before thinking to ask Paul, our resident sprinter hoarder, whether he had one. He had one. The flange that I took off it, the flange that fought me harder than an unwilling entrant to the Colosseum, was the mounting point for the handbrake. That would have caught a few ankles in the passage between the cab and the load area had I not done away with it. Just looking at all these repairs needed, I've done it again. For literally the third time, I've fooled myself into thinking the rust wasn't as bad as it is. The cab was well on its way to Valhalla. You know, there are vans in Paul's yard in better shape, if I'm honest. Not better mechanically, probably, but body-wise for sure. The difference is, I'm willing to put the hours into mine, if not the dollars. Or maybe the difference is, I've put too many hours into mine already to stop now.
Shade Tree Mechanics, ho! This is such a high level of shanky, it almost hurts. If the intro wasn't on the nose enough for you, I feel stupid doing this, but I'm stubborn. And frankly, better this than working for the man. Big wheel, keep on turning. And soon I'll be rolling. This is where most of the water was pooling, both front foot wells, and it's how I realised there was standing water hiding in the cab. The brightest orange patches are rust stains on the exterior under seal, the metal long rusted to oblivion. It's not obvious, but there's quite a slope in the upper section of floor here, around where the three plastic grommets for the tread plate trim screws go. When the water pooled high enough in the well to reach the grommets, it would weep out, and one day, I happened to notice the drip and damp patch outside under the van. And repairing this marks the last cab repair to the passenger side of the van. We're making progress.
Okay, fine. It seemed well-tastic, but it's looking a lot better. There are a few little tweaks to do on this side of the van, but it's just about time to pull it out of the unit, swing it around, tackle the same repair in the driver's side footwell, and then get the alpine glass into the roof. Then it's full push for painting the whole exterior. I'm not getting into grinding these welds back, there's no need. I'm just too keen to get back to the Lotus. And thanks for sticking around. I realize this build isn't the most compelling, but if nothing else, it's a lesson in sheer scale of project and perseverance. And now you know, there's a bigger picture. Special mention to Soup patrons for funding all this. They're the ones keeping me rolling. Thank you, Pablo Nabal, Berlin Heck, Ted Ill, Stuart Walker, Connell Cheevers, Greg Wisdom, Roger Treadwell, Peter, Sebastian Tomaszewski, and Kevin Campo, and to all my patrons, thank you. If you'd like to help fund the channel and get behind the scenes updates on my projects, head over to my website for options. The link is in the description. That's it for now. Stay tuned, stay stuck in, and good luck. Thank you.